Good morning, everyone. I'm not even sure what time is it for me, but, uh, <laughs> but we'll make it work. Uh, who in this room is uh, an entrepreneur or going to be an entrepreneur after this school? Okay, so for you in particular, it's definitely going to be valuable. Um, and so what I would like to do this morning is, uh, um, is speak a little bit about uh, uh, entrepreneurship and the journey, um, and then a little bit about the story of ways. Um, and the uh, um, last part may be about disruption. Um, and, uh, and this is very important. The disruption point of it is very, very important. In particular, if you think you're going to change the world, and you should, because the people around me here are the ones that can, then if you change the world, it means that you're going to make a significant impact. And that means that, uh, that something is going to be changed. So, uh, so entrepreneurship, it usually starts with, uh, with a very, very strong feeling, right? So um, either love or hate. Um, that leads you into um, developing a passion. So, so in that sense, I hate traffic jams, right? And I, I took a quick note at the, uh, at the list here, and I've seen people from, uh, uh, from Brazil. And, uh, um, and if you are in Sao Paulo, then I guess you hate traffic jams as well. London is not a good place either. Um, and in fact, most of the metropolitan areas actually have um, pretty severe traffic jams. Um, and it evolves into, um, into passion, into a dream. And you start to, um, uh, to realize that if this is what you're going to do, then there is a lot of sacrifice that needs to be made. And, and in fact, this is going to be the only thing that you will be doing during that period of time. Um, and the journey of a startup is a roller coaster. Right, really a roller coaster. Imagine the most scary roller coaster in your life that there are ups and downs and sometimes there are twice a day, right? So twice a day you would be on the top of the world and on the bottom of the world um, in, in difference of, uh, of hours. Right? Um, one of the best uh, venture capitals in the US is Andreessen Horwitz and, uh, uh, and Ben Horwitz when he was a CEO he was one, uh, once asked if he slept well while he was a uh, CEO and he said, I slept like a baby. I woke up every two hours and cried. <laughs> and, and that's the state of mind, right? So, so, um, 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 and, and so if you don't like extreme sports, then maybe, uh, maybe startup journey is not for you. Um, and at the same time, if you would ask an entrepreneur what's next for them, <coughs> it's always the next startup. In most cases, if you would tell them, okay, so, so after this startup, what exactly are you going to do? And they will tell you, okay, we're going to build a new startup. Um, if you would ask them, okay, this new startup, what it's all about? They actually know. So um, we started Waze in 2007, and officially in 2008. And we only launched the product in 2009. By that time, I already knew what my next startup is all about. And by the time I got to start that, I already knew what's my next startup and after next and after next and so forth. And I try to build all of them. Um, but, uh, but I'm perfectly okay if I'm uh, just going to build some. So think about um, building a startup or starting a startup from idea to, uh, to actually starting as something that is exactly like falling in love. So imagine that there are many ideas that you start to think of and eventually you pick one and you say, this is the one. Or <coughs> you go to many dates and eventually you pick one and you say, um, she is the one, right? And at the beginning, you only spend time with the idea, right? So you look at the idea from different perspective and you start to, ask, to answer yourself, um, how would I take that to the market and how the product looks like? And, the, uh, um, and you only spend time yourself and the idea or you only spend time with the date, right? You don't want anyone to interfere until, until you feel confident enough. And then you start to tell your friends about your idea. And usually this is where they will tell you that uh, it will never work, right? Or uh, <laughs> this is uh, the stupidest idea that I ever heard. Um, or you take your date out to meet your friends and they are saying, uh, she's not for you, right? And then you actually disengage from your friends. And it's good that this is the case, right? So because if you are not in love with the idea, then, um, then most likely you will not go through the, the hardship of the journey. 
and uh, um, <clears throat> and I would say um, you know um, sometimes people ask me what do I think about their idea and sometimes I think it's great and sometimes I think it's it suck and I will tell them right and uh, some of them say that okay I gave up on the idea and I think to myself you were he was that person was simply not enough in love with the idea because otherwise they wouldn't listen and it's good that you don't listen because all the revolutions that happens in the last uh, ever actually people told the other people that uh, that will never work right or this is the stupidest idea that they ever heard now when you come to think about it this is the reality right most of the people don't like changes and uh, entrepreneurs leave for changes right in particular they're going to do something that is uh, is changing something in addition as an entrepreneur you spend time with the idea right so you have enough time to think of to think through and you are kind of baked already into this idea and obviously you believe in that and when you tell that to someone that is the first time that they hear that it's a change and they haven't had enough time to think about it so most likely they would say no <coughs> the journey the, the journey is very complex it's uh, um, and even if at the beginning you have some um, um, some you know a lot of enthusiasm and good feedback from the environment and someone writes on you on the paper and take runs, uh, write something about you it's all goodness right but then you launch the product and you realize that it's not good enough and uh, uh, the lack of traction period is like trying to cross the desert right so imagine a big desert that you uh, you try to cross and you walk all day and it's only sand around you and you keep on walking all night long and all day long and it's only sand around you don't even pay attention to the fact that you're making progress but in reality you do slowly baby steps one after the other um, until you get out of the desert now all the startups are go going through that and those that uh, um, that are not in love with the idea or um, their mission is not right or the DNA of the company is not right are probably going to die in the desert um, obviously, if you go through the desert, then it's a, um, it's a different story. In the, the journey itself is a journey of failures. So, um, in reality, you know, we, we, we are going to do something new that no one did before, right? And we think we know what to do, but in reality, we don't. We obviously believe that we know what we are doing, uh, but this is new. And so we try something, and if it doesn't work, we try something else. And if it doesn't work, we keep on trying until we find one thing that does work. And uh, as soon as we do, it just buys us the ticket to the next part of the journey. So if the first part of the journey would be product market fit, so figuring out, okay, this is the problem, and we are building a product to solve this problem, if we are able to get the feedback from the users that it actually does that, then we move to the next phase of the journey, which could be how do, we I scale, how do I scale, or how do I go global, or how do I make money out of that? And, uh, um, and imagine that as... So, so there is this mountain that you want to climb, and, uh, um, and if this is a journey of failures, then you try from the left and it doesn't work. You get down, you try from the middle, you try from different angles to, to actually climb on this mountain. And eventually you get to the top of the mountain to realize that this is not a mountain, just a hill before the mountain, right? And then you, it, the, and the hill is, uh, or the next mountain is actually bigger than, than the first one. And so, um, so um, like video games, right? Every time that you move to the next phase, it's becoming more and more and more complex. And, uh, um, and this is the journey. <coughs> By the way, one, one more thing about that. Um, if you're afraid to fail, then in reality you already failed because you're not going to go into this journey. And uh, um, I can... Um, I can quote uh, Michael Jordan on that, that, uh, that says that he can accept failure but not accept not trying. Or um, anyone from Canada here? Okay, so uh, Wayne Gretzky, maybe the, uh, 
the best hockey player ever um, ever been uh, that says that he is missing a hundred percent of the shots that he doesn't take and uh, um, and that's the reality right if we if we're afraid to fail and not taking this path because we're afraid to fail then in reality we already failed <coughs> Some of the things that we're going to do in the first year are actually the most dramatic for the future of the, um, um, of the startup. And, and the most critical one is actually the DNA of the company we are building. So when we started Waze, we told ourselves that this is going to be the best working place we ever had. And in reality, when you start, you don't think about it. You tend to think about... Um, the mission and the problem and the go-to-market and, and different things, but not necessarily on the fact that you are starting a new working place. And it's up to you to determine what kind of working place it's going to be. And, uh, and if you stop for a second and you define that, and it doesn't matter if this is a new startup or a new department or a new project team, it's your opportunity to decide what's the DNA of this place. What are the values that we stand for? What kind of people we would like to bring on board? Um, how we are going to work together. Because at the end of the day, this is what's going to determine <coughs> whether or not you like the everyday work or not. And if the team is right, and the DNA is right, then every day is, is a day that you like. And if it's not, every day is a day that you hate. <coughs> a lot of people ask myself, ask me whether or not I think that their idea is good or not good. and. Uh, and usually I will send them back with, uh, uh, um, with two major things. Right? So one of them will be, okay, so what's the problem you're going to solve and who actually have this problem? Just to realize that we are solving real problem and creating real value. And then the other part will be how the market will change if you are successful. Now, if you don't know to answer that, it's not big enough. Where is the impact? How the world is going to become a better place if there is no impact? <coughs> and if they don't know to, to answer that, then maybe it's not big enough. Maybe they don't think through. Um, um, and, uh, um, and a lot of people are actually going back and saying, OK, this is not going to make an impact. Now, I'm not saying that this is not a good business. It could be excellent business. But if you're not going to make an impact, then, um, then who will? Find a problem that it's worth solving. Find a problem that the world is going to be a better place if the problem disappears. And then tell yourself, OK, here is the problem. And I can define that. And I can imagine who had this problem. And go to all those people that you imagine that they actually have this problem and ask them if they have this problem. And in particular, what you really want is their perception of the problem. And only then you can go ahead and build a solution. Now, if you do that this way, you will find out that, uh, um, that you're actually solving a problem that it's worth solving. And, um, and I'm coming for, uh, about from about three weeks in Latin America. Uh, the last two were in Argentina. And, uh, um, and one of the days, I, uh, I took a taxi there. And uh, um, they essentially ripped me off. Um, in particular, because the day before, I took the same route, and it was uh, less than half the price. Um, and I started to ask myself, OK, so obviously this is, uh, um, I'm not the first person on the board that it's actually happened to them. Um, and, uh, um, and I um, post a question on Facebook, whether or not people care, and whether or not they would use something to provide them with a solution, because it's really easy to build a solution for that. And out of um, 72 people, only two or three say that they would actually use a solution for that. Everyone else would say, um, no, I would use the meter. No, I would use Uber. Um, it's not a real issue. I don't even notice when they're ripping me off. Um, different answers. So, so what I thought is a problem and it's worth solving turns out to be uh, not worth solving. Not a lot of people care. Um, now, the ways journey is, um, is, is very, very interesting, in particular because, um, because when we started, 
what we really wanted to do is help people to avoid traffic jams. So in order to do that, we need a lot of people. Um, we needed to have good traffic information, and the way for us to figure out where traffic information is is by the drivers, right? So we are um, going to collect from the drivers, from the device of the drivers, um, where they are and how fast they are moving, and as a result, we can figure out where all traffic jams are and, uh, and help the rest of the drivers. Now, obviously, in order to do that, we need a lot of drivers. And, uh, um, and at the time, um, so if you really need a lot of users, then the application needs to be free. That's quite obvious, right? And at the time, if we wanted to offer a service like that, we needed to have digital maps. And at the time, they were very, very expensive. And so a business model where you buy something that is very, very expensive and give it away for free, um, <laughs> it's not a good business model. And so we figure out that we need to own our own maps. And the, um, the magic of ways is that it actually builds its own maps. And so when we started, the blank page that you see there was the map of Tel Aviv, or the map of London, or the map of everywhere. So I realized that you're coming from a lot of different places. Each one of you, when we started, it was a blank page. And the first driver that drove we collected the GPS data from the device, and if we will take this data and draw that on the blank page, it would look like that. And if we will start to take that from a lot of drivers, we are starting to get something that looks like a map. Right? If I will tell you that this is a, a traffic circle in the middle, then it is a traffic circle in the middle. We can even see that, right? And we can tell the difference between uh, um, main road and street, and we, if there is an intersection that no one is making right turn, then no right turn is allowed, right? And, uh, and if there is a road that there are 100 people going into one direction and no one else coming the other direction, that will be one-way street. And if there is a road that there are 100 people going into one direction and only two coming the other way around, that will be one-way street in Tel Aviv. <laughs> and uh, um, anyone with a uh, computer science background here? Okay, so if I can describe that, we can build the software to build it. And this is exactly what we did. We build the software that takes all this data and creates the map out of that. Now, the map obviously is not complete at the beginning, and it takes more long period, uh, period of time for the map to become complete. Then we enabled map editing tools to allow people to provide us with uh, street names and house numbers and points of interest and so forth. Now, at this phase, if we will have someone that driving slow, then we can figure out that there is a traffic jam there. And if we have a lot of those, then we can figure out where all the traffic jams are, and we can start people, and we can start to route people to avoid them. And this is really the magical phase. This is how it works. Now, in addition, people can report on um, where speed traps are, which is very, very important. So I didn't have any speeding ticket since 2009. Um, and where, um, you know, what really happens on the road if there are accidents and stuff like that. Now, what we are seeing in this video is how the map was actually created in, um, in a few places in Eastern Europe. And, uh, um, and you can see the date, beginning of 2010. Uh, this is where we launched the service. And it took about uh, six months for the map to become good enough. Now, this is significant, right? So uh, Waze is free and good enough. Free and good enough wins the market. This is very, very important thing to remember. Free and good enough wins the market. Now, in reality, um, so what we're seeing here is still uh, uh, Bratislava. Um, um, the magic is that this is created like out of nowhere, right? was created by the drivers. We didn't even know. The funny part is that this video was created by someone in, in Eastern Europe that actually created this video by capturing the map day after day and then edited that. And we didn't even know about that until sometimes in 2011, someone approached me and said, uh, you know that we can do a better editing of the video for you? And I asked them, what video? Right? And then uh, we started to use that as the model. Um, by the way, if you drive someplace that no one drove before, then your avatar will change into a rotor steamer. 
and you de facto pave the road as you drive and this road will be on the map tomorrow morning for everyone else to be used. So, so the magic is that we the drivers helps the rest of the drivers um, to avoid traffic jams and avoid the uh, speeding tickets and, uh, um, and when you find common enemy it's very easy to harness people. Now the journey itself so maybe one more word about that. Uh, <coughs> the first version of Waze was running on a PDA. Remember PDA? <laughs> long, long, long time ago, there were dinosaurs, and then PDAs, and then Nokia phones, and today we are here with, uh, with uh, iPhones and Android. Now, this is not that long time ago, right? So the first version was in 2008. The next version was running on was a real-time version running on a Nokia phone. This is 2009, less than a decade ago. So is that means that if we will do fast forward 10 years into the future, then we wouldn't have iPhones and Androids? Probably right. If I would be here in 10 years and we will do a gathering, all of us together, and I will need to remind you that remember that 10 years ago we had iPhones and stuff like that? Very likely. In fact, if you think of the uh, top 10 technology companies in the world, five of them will disappear from the top 10 in the next decade. Actually, some of them will go bankrupt. Now, the only problem is that we don't know which one, right? Otherwise, we will sell short. <laughs> um, and they will be replaced by a startup that just started recently. Now, if you don't believe me, then um, ask yourself, okay, when, do you have Facebook account? Raise your hand for a second. Okay, excellent. If you had a Facebook account 10 years ago, raise your hand. I think you are, uh, you, you will need to go and check that out, right? I don't think so. Facebook exists for 12 years, right? Um, Okay, if you used Google 20 years ago, raise your hand. <laughs> if you actually bought something on Amazon 20 years ago, raise your hand. Um, that's, and it's not because you're young. It's because they're young. Amazon is 20 years old, right? Google is 20 years old. This is it. Um, if you had an Apple device more than a decade ago, raise your hand. Very few, right? Now today, you either had Mac, or during, over this period of time, you had uh, um, uh, different devices. But without the iPhones, and without the iPod, and without, the, uh, um, uh, without this revolution, Apple probably wouldn't be existing today. So we are looking at the major revolutions that happens within a decade, and this is the, p the pace of innovation, or the pace of revolutions, is actually increasing. Sorry? Can I ask a question? Or sure, yeah, go ahead. Oh. Because it's interesting. So basically, you had GPS data, and from that you get the trust. So the, the key was to getting the GPS data from the drivers. With all the GPS technology, you would not be able to that's right. So um, the magic of Waze is that um, it is everyone contributes their data, and the important data is where they are and how fast they are going. And so when you are using Waze, every other driver is enjoying the fact that we know where you are and how fast you are going. We don't know who you are, but you know that there is someone using Waze and driving at this particular speed that can help us to figure out where the roads are and where traffic jams are. So, um, so it's actually started by the CTO of Waze, Ehud Chaptai, in 2006. And he built the first version on a PDA that the approach was to um, actually create a map. So the same device, the same app, is creating the map as you drive. And tomorrow morning, and actually this is a device that you needed to sync up, right? So connect the PDA to the computer and, and go to the internet through the computer and sync that up. Um, 
um, upload all the information and download the new version of the map and uh, and so you can use that um, and we had uh, maybe a couple of hundreds of users in 2006 and then in 2007 um, we met um, Ehud, Amir and myself, so the, the three founders, and we decided that uh, the concept is interesting I and mean, it's going to be in particular interesting if we're going to take that into a smartphone and figure out where, uh, in real time where traffic jams are and help people to avoid traffic jams. And so in 2007 we decided that we're going to build Waze um, and we uh, spend some time amongst us in order to uh, fall in love with that. Uh, and when we were in love, we were um, pretty sure that now we can go ahead and raise capital because we, we thought that the idea is, is really novel. Right? And so we went to venture capitals in Israel, and there are a lot of venture capitals in Israel, and, uh, um, and they say no. You go to the first one and you tell them the story and they say no. And then the next one says no and no and no and a lot of times. Um, and over time you get better in telling the story and you um, show just a little bit more traction and, uh, um, and you know how to answer the uh, uh, question better. And, uh, um, and eventually only in 2008 we were able to raise capital. Now part of the deal was um, that we had um, multiple um, meetings with one of the venture capitals and they scheduled a meeting with all the partners and before we went there we made sure that we figure out where the uh, home addresses of all the partners and we made sure that all their houses are on the map <laughs> and, uh, um, and in order to add more then we made sure that there are other in the same street there are other houses on the map so it doesn't look awkward right and, uh, <laughs> and uh, um, Sure enough, during the presentation, the managing the uh, partner asked me, so, so is that possible that my house will be on the map? And I said, look, I don't know where you live, so, uh, <laughs> so tell me the address and we'll see, right? And, uh, um, and obviously, um, everyone was looking at the map and I was looking at his eyes and then I figured out that he is going to invest. Now, um, immediately after that, once they gave us the term sheet, uh, the next day, I went to um, pretty much everyone else that, uh, um, that was uh, um, involved in dialogues and was actually pretty progressing dialogues, and I told them, look, I'm going to sign a term sheet by the end of the week, and I don't care if it's yours or someone else. And so sure enough, we had three term sheets by the end of the week, um, which basically means, and this is really, really dramatic, when you go raise capital from venture capitals, they had a hundred times more experience than you in this space. Find someone that can guide you through because um, they sort of play unfair. Right? So this is like a, um, a professional league versus a kids league. Right? And so find someone that can help you. 2008, we got the money, we started the company, and we launched the first version in the, at the beginning of 2009. And that was only in Israel. In a lot of excitement, and actually Israel is a very, very small place. Um, you know, when, when you um, consider Israel in terms of area, this is about 20,000 square kilometers, right? So size of uh, Massachusetts. Right? really tiny. Now most of the population is actually in about one-third of the area. <coughs> the rest is pretty much a desert, right? So, uh, so very dense area, very, very high-tech, very, very connected. Um, and the result was that it was relatively easy to create a map in a small space. Right? Um, and so it was working beautifully in Israel and we decided that, uh, um, okay, if, it's, if the model works, we can go and take that everywhere. And so we did. And in reality, it was actually working nicely in a few places in Eastern Europe. So in Latvia and the Czech Republic and Slovakia and, uh, um, and in a few places in Latin America, in Ecuador, because we had a partner there, and then in Colombia and uh, um, in particular in, in Bogota. And, and, but it was not good enough in London. It was not good enough in the US. It was not good enough anywhere that is actually a significant place. 
And the scary part is, um, is that you understand that it's not good enough. You see by the numbers that you get out of the system that it doesn't work. And then you go ahead and speak with the drivers and you get their feedbacks and they tell you, okay, it doesn't work for us. We like the story that we, the drivers, are going to harness all of our combined knowledge together and to help the rest of the drivers to avoid traffic jams. Um, but, uh, but it doesn't work. And so we go back into the drawing board and we um, take all this feedback and we correct that. We fix, we build the next version that fixes everything that we know. And we release that and we know that this is it. And it's not. Sorry, can I just ask, what, what, would, what, did you, what, would, what would you have considered not working at that time? So not working is always the same. Are people coming back or not? Right. At the end of the day, it's the retention or the attrition, right? You had some markets which worked after a time, but presumably at the beginning they also didn't work. So would you, and then they started to work. Not everything worked straight away, right? Right. Right. So when you had a, a market that reached a point, <coughs> a tipping point to start to work, is, is would, that, would that be within a certain time frame? And the ones that didn't work, they went past that time frame, so they it accumulated too many frustrated users? or. What was the difference between a market that began to work and a market that didn't? So, so there, are, there are a few factors into that. Number one is, uh, um, is smaller markets tends to work better. <coughs> the larger market, the um, distribution of the population turns out to be a little bit more complex. Um, and so this is one factor. The other factor that turns out to be dramatic is um, um, the availability of alternative solutions, right? So. Um, so if, uh, if you're looking at Eastern Europe or Latin America, there was no other GPS solutions there. There was not even a digital map of the country, right? So, so they're not good enough in other places was actually good enough in some places. Um, by the way, if you choose your go-to-market strategy and you want to, become, to go global, so the first country to start is your, own, is your own country, right? It's much easier, you're gonna learn faster. Um, you understand a lot of things, you can collect feedback faster, you will learn faster there. The next country is pick a significant country that it's easy to win. So maybe because user acquisition is going to be inexpensive, maybe because there is no competition and therefore you're going to be successful there, um, but not go directly into the largest market. Largest market are usually the hardest to win and user acquisition might be expensive and you think you're gonna have PR and it will work. It doesn't. PR in, in, in Israel works like magic, right? So, uh, so it's a small place um, and it's not expensive. PR in London is very expensive. PR in New York is even more expensive and has close to zero impact. And so figure out where, where is the geography that it's easy to win. So, uh, um, so we are going back into um, product evolutions, right? And so we, we, we build the next version, it doesn't work, and we do the same thing again. We collect feedbacks from the users, we collect feedbacks from the system, we understand what doesn't work, and we go and build the next version to fix that. And, um, and it's not. And, ye and the, throughout the entire year, we had multiple iterations of trying to solve that and solve that, and each time that we did, we made insignificant improvement. But throughout the year, all those insignificant improvements turned out to become significant. And, um, and perhaps it was also the maturity of, or the accumulations of the, of the map that was built over time. Um, and only at the beginning of 2011, we started to see places that uh, um, um, it's actually uh, um, getting together and we are reaching critical mass and, uh, um, and if we're looking at the US that was Los Angeles first and then have San Francisco and Atlanta and Washington DC and New York and Chicago and one metropolitan after the other. In Europe that was Italy first and then Netherlands and France and Spain and Sweden and one country after the other. Um, and uh, um, so that was in 2011 and we figure out that we, yes. At this point, you are thinking already about your next startup. That's what you said. So are you already thinking about, I'm just going to expand enough so someone knocks on the door and I sell? Or are you already thinking about your exit at this point? No. You, um, look, exits come to you, right? They, it's not that you're looking for them. If you're looking for them, that means that uh, 
that you are under a lot of stress and um, and they came to us so you don't think about that you think about um, um, how do I make a bigger impact and at the end of the day you also accept the, the opportunity to sell the company when you have an opportunity to make a bigger impact and so 2011 uh, we're starting to reach critical mass in multiple places um, when we started the year we had a little bit over a million users. When we finished the year, we had 10 million users. At the beginning of the year, we said we're going to reach 10 million users. We didn't know where they are going to come from. Um, but in a lot of places, they simply, um, you know, as soon as you reach critical mass, then you see significant growth. And then in 2012, Waze was actually growing faster than the entire industry together. So you take all the, the, the navigation devices and navigation apps and in-car navigation systems. Waze was growing faster than all of them together. And then in 2013, Google came up with uh, the proposal to approach us. And we simply said yes. They came up with a one-page term sheet. And uh, everything that was important for us was there. And uh, um, part of the deal is that they say that it's going to take them a week to, to have a uh, final uh, document. And it was 10 days, actually. So when someone wants to move fast, they can. Um, and I left the day after I left in order to build my next startups. Um, so just to, to complete the, the, the question that was here before, um, I was running the company at the first year, and then I brought a CEO to run the company, Noam Bardeen, who is still running the company. And, uh, um, and I was doing business development, I was doing new country strategy, I was doing different things in the company, but I was not mandatory uh, to, um, to stay after the acquisition, and this is why I was able to leave. Yes. So, um, so, so you are right. Um, in consumer services, the product is the main thing. However, any business model that requires critical mass, whether or not this is a marketplace or something, something like that or whatever it is, there is a lot of business development that is being done behind the scenes. So everyone cheats, right? You find a way, if you're building a marketplace, you find a way to have indefinite amount of inventory and a way to control that. So you can actually have people coming and buying and there is always enough, in, enough stuff on the, on, the, on, on the shelves, right? In this model, we have used, uh, we have established a lot of partnerships with uh, fleet management companies in order to collect their GPS and actually even though that the map was not good enough on day one, the traffic was actually good enough on day one. And, uh, um, uh, and, uh, and in addition, you do a lot of things uh, throughout the product um, um, that, uh, that help people to, um, to um, use that more often, like gamification, like uh, telling people that they're not alone, right? You start ways today, it tells you that there are so and so many other ways users around you it doesn't tell you how far it's around you, right? So when we started, <laughs> around you was um, the entire continent, right? So, <laughs> so you would get, you are in San Francisco and you would get a report of an accident in St. Louis, right? Um, and then we figure out that maybe it's not a good thing to do, so people complain about that. Um, but you use business development in order to accelerate. So, so imagine a virtuous cycle, right? So you have the users on one hand, and the more users that you have, you create better data, right? The more data that you have, it's easier to bring more users or for more users to stay. And so you need to inject any of those in order into the system in order to accelerate the growth. And, and it's always easier to inject data in that sense. Uh, business model, when we started, Look, this is 2007. Navtech was just acquired by Nokia for $8 billion, right? $8.1 billion. And uh, um, 
And a few months later, um, Teleatlas, which was the second biggest map maker, was acquired by TomTom um, for four and a half billion dollars, right? And so we thought that um, we have a better factory to generate maps and generate uh, traffic information. And so we're going to sell maps and traffic information. But over time, when we got there, we realized that uh, um, um, we have something that is dramatically more significant, and this is the actual amount of usage that we have. Not users, but usage. And if you have a lot of users with very, very high usage, then advertisement is a better way to monetize that. So, um, building on that question, how and when do you know that you've solved the problem? Or does that evolve as you start getting new users and the new markets? Um, so, so the key metrics would be retention and usage. Right? If usage per, per driver is increasing, then you are keep on improving. The day that it stops, you either um, you know materialize the entire market, or you are not improving anymore. Um, and retention is the same. And uh, you look at what is custom in the industry and what people are expecting in terms of retention, as soon as you get there, you are good enough. Now, in reality, if you will use those metrics and you would run a service with the drivers, you will see that the correlation is very, very high. So if people are happy and satisfied and, and they think it's valuable, then they stay. If they're not, then they're not. Um, the good news is that when you measure everything, it's much faster, right? If you have the metrics out of the system and you can figure out, uh, you know, it, it, and the metrics came to the level that if someone will tell me at the time, um, okay, um, we have seen uh, um, a spike in uh, the number of users, the number of active daily users in Bogota last night. And then I would say, okay, um, there is a holiday there. And if they'll tell me, no, no, there is no holiday, then I would say, OK, it's raining. Right? So you would figure out all the nuances and all the differences over time uh, to the level that you can uh, build the, um, the state of the nation reports based on the speed of the cars. Right? Because if, uh, in reality, Spain was under um, a lot of pressure during a period, some of the years, and uh, and what happened is that the speed during the busy hours is, in, is increasing because less people are going to work. And so the roads are free, speed is increasing, right? And the other way around. And you can figure out, you can figure out the economical crisis based on, on that information. How do you initially get users in cities which are unmapped to start using your app in order to create these fastest maps, et cetera? So uh, I think the first bullet here says who the users are, right? This is even more important. So obviously for us, when we think about it, OK, you, you come to an app that is supposed to be driving and traffic app. And you download the app, and there is nothing around you, right? So you would give up the same day. Not if you are enthusiastic amateur. Not if you care about that. Not if you actually have multiple GPS devices, or you care about GIS, or you're frustrated with the fact that the, the, your in-car navigation system doesn't have the street that you live in. And here you have a system that you can actually add that. And so the, the first users were enthusiastic amateurs. And they were doing some of the heavy lifting for the rest of us at the beginning. And they are um, always enthusiastic amateurs. In fact, if you can figure out where these online groups are, um, you can approach them easily. Just a follow up detail about the um, fleet management companies that you bought the GPS data from, which is a super smart cheat. Were you paying for that, or did you come to some other kind of? In some yeah. cases, we did. You were willing to pay. That was not expensive. In some cases, we negotiate a barter deal, so we will give them maps and traffic information in return. Um, across multiple markets. But also in some cases, um, well, in, in some countries, there were local map makers that we negotiate similar deals, right? So we basically told them, give me your map, and I'll give you map updates. Mm -hmm. And if they, um, 
And obviously at the beginning it doesn't sound right, but then I told them, look, there are only two ways to look at it, right? If I'm right and my model works, you will die. If I'm wrong, then it doesn't matter. Yes? So um, OpenStreetMap was um, not good at the time. It's improving. In this particular, it's not good for, uh, for navigation. So when you look at map, um, then there is the display, which is one part of it. There are the different layers of, of, uh, of the maps. There is searchability. And there is navig navigability, so whether or not you know which directions the roads are, are capable in. And they were not good at this, and so we decided not to use that. Okay, and my second question is, uh, GPS accuracy is really like 40 meters uh, in the countryside. How from the 40 meters accuracy to pinpoint uh, roads? So uh, moving average, and in reality, even though that you have um, the, the a single GPS point is not necessarily accurate. If you start to collect a lot of those, then that turns out to be very accurate to the, to the level of, uh, um, of when you compare that with satellite image, you are um, on, the, on the millimeter. Yes. Do you want to tell us where we can find the images? I am completely out of ways uh, more than three and a half years now. So, the rating of ways for London now? I mean, ways is part of Google. Um, ways is ways, and Google is Google, right? So, the Google is the owner, the owner of ways, but uh, as an app, there are two different apps. Okay. Can we just leave, leave it there? So, um, so, some of the critical tips that I have to share with you. Um, so who the users are and what's their perception of the problem. We, just, we mentioned that this is, I cannot stress how important it is. Um, otherwise, you might be building something that, uh, uh, that you are the only users in the world for that. Or you might end up with a solution that is looking for a problem. Understand who the users are and what's their perception of the problem. And, uh, uh, and always do that at the beginning before you even start to build the product. The second one is about making mistakes fast. In reality, we only learn when we try. Otherwise, we don't. So for me, if people will tell me I'm building this product and I'm going to launch that in, uh, in a few months or whatever, then I say, no, no, you're wrong. You're not building the product. Product development starts after you launch. Only then you can have fast enough feedback and significant feedbacks that will tell you what you're doing wrong and how to fix that. And so the product iteration starts after you launch. Now, in reality, um, the biggest enemy of good enough is perfect. If you try to build something that is perfect, you're going to lose the market to someone that is going to be good enough. Now, if you don't believe me, then think about uh, the first version of iPhone. Even making calls, it was unable to do, right? So it, it really sucked. Um, and this is with hardware, right? In particular, if this is software only, then, then there is no big deal. I would say launch today, right? And, uh, and so people will tell me, OK, but people, that users are going to be frustrated. You don't even have users. Who is going to be frustrated? <laughs> um, and uh, um, it's insignificant <laughs> numbers, right? And if it's that bad, then change the name and relaunch. <laughs> right. The name is not important. By the way, the story of the name Waze is that uh, um, at the beginning we called the company LinkMap and we, we wanted a better name. And so we were looking for a name and the Waze that spells correctly, W-A-Y-S, uh, the URL cost half a million dollars and we didn't have that. Uh, but this one cost $12,000 that we did have. And so this is how we ended up with the name. The only important part of the name is uh, you're really looking for a name that is easy to pronounce, and, uh, um, um, and, uh, and this is it, right? And uh, um, if you can find a name that people can use as a verb later, then this is excellent, but it's not mandatory. Easy to pronounce, easy to spell, this is it. Um, one more story about uh, 
making mistakes fast. So there, this story is about uh, two guys that are going into a safari in Africa. And, uh, and safari is very interesting, but it's not really challenging. There is no dangers there. And so they decided that they're going to do something more extreme and spend the night out on a tent outside of the camp. And sure enough, during the middle of the night, there is a roar of a lion and they, they woke up and that was a pretty scary moment for them. And one guy say, what are we going to do? What shall we do? And the other guy say, let's, let's run back to the camp. Yeah, yeah, this is a good idea. And so one guy is starting to put his sneakers on and the other guy tells him, are you nuts? You really think you're going to outrun the lion? Say, no, 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 no. I need to outrun you. <laughs> okay, so being fast enough, not necessarily fastest, fast enough. We mentioned the DNA, uh, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. Every day of your life, I want you to think about the problem. This is why we started this company, in order to address this problem. Claim ownership of the problem, not the solution. That will put you in a much better market position than everyone else. That will put you in a position that you can actually can engage users through the problem, not through the solutions, much better. Focus, um, I think that's my shirt, right? The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. Very hard for a startup, in particular, that we are not clear at the beginning where exactly we are going. And, uh, um, and a lot of people will tell us, okay, but you can do that also for, for you know, you can do ways for bike riders or for horse riders or for how, uh, fleet management and they are even going to pay you, right? And, uh, and it's very easy to get distracted. Now in order to be successful, a startup needs to do only one thing right. And uh, um, that means that we are not going to deal with uh, anything else. Now the last one is critically important because, um, because I ended up with uh, um, keep on building startups and all the time looking for uh, entrepreneurs to fulfill that and to, to become the team to execute that. And I spoke with a lot of entrepreneurs that failed, that their last startup failed, and I asked them why. And half of them said because the team was not right. And team was not right, it's not necessarily means that uh, some of the team were incapable, maybe they were um, lack of communication, maybe they had all the same skill set and they needed diversifications of skill set, or maybe there was uh, ego management issues. Actually, always there are ego management issues. Um, but the team was not right. And then I asked them, okay, so when did you know that the team is not right? And all of them knew within the first month. All of them. Some of them said before we even started. <laughs> and, um, um, but all of them knew within the first month. And so the real problem is that the CEO didn't make the hard decision. Now, making easy decisions is easy. Making hard decisions is hard. And because it's hard, no one likes to make them. And they're, throughout any organization, being pushed all the way up to the top of the organization, to the CEO. Now, if the CEO does not make the hard decisions, the rest of the team actually know that. Everyone else knows that. And so there are only two options. The CEO doesn't see that or doesn't know, which means that the CEO is a complete idiot. Um, or even worse, right? The CEO does know and still doesn't do anything, which means that he doesn't have the leadership and the ability to make hard decisions. At either case, the top performers would leave because they don't want to be in that organization and they know that they can find a better job. And this is very, very problematic. Now, if you're going to run a startup or a company or an organization and you are in charge of making the hard decisions, then every time that there is a hard decision to be made, I will suggest you two very, very powerful tools. One of them is ask yourself, if I'm going to quit tomorrow morning and someone else, someone new is going to step in, what decision that someone knew is going to make. Because we release ourselves for a second from the history, from the parts that actually prevent us from making those hard decisions. And we ask ourselves fresh. Now, part of the reason that it's very hard for us because of the history is that we made the previous decision and making a different one means that we 
need to say that the previous one was incorrect. Maybe it was correct at the time, but today it's incorrect. And it's very hard to make that, uh, to say that to ourselves or to say that to someone else. And, uh, um, and that one, um, so, so when I was a, uh, a teenager, um, I had to make a decision to choose between two things. And, uh, and I went to my dad to ask for his point of view. And he said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a coin out of my pocket. I'm going to flip the coin. And before the coin drops, make the decision. So use all of your knowledge, what we call guts feeling, which is really everything that we know to make that decision. In most cases, we actually know what we want. But it's very hard for us to to say it up loud, or to say it um, out loud. And so um, when you force the decision, the decision is probably right. Um, OK, so, um, so fundraising. Um, so, so a few months ago, um, I went into one of the largest venture capitals in Israel, and I sat down with the managing partner, and I asked the guy, how long does it take you to decide if you like the entrepreneur or not? And so he asked me, OK, do you want the real answer or do you want the right answer? And I said, I want the real answer for a change. <laughs> and so the guy is, is looking at me and then looking at the door and looking at me again. And then he said, before they sit down. First impression. Right? There are some researchers that speaks about 40 milliseconds. But it's definitely a matter of seconds, right? It's the same if we are interviewing a candidate or going on a date or an investor is meeting us. Seconds. And we only have a few minutes to actually either let it sink or change that. Now, in reality, in today's world, in some cases, it's even negative time, right? So the first impression is even established before we meet. So they search on, on Google, they search, um, there is a reputation, there is recommendation. There are different things that will uh, show up even before you meet in terms of establishing the first impression. And if this is the case, then we have to start with the strongest point that we have in our story. Whatever it is, right? Maybe it's the team, maybe it's the size of the problem, maybe it's the, um, the traction that we have, maybe it's the whatever it is. We start with that, because maybe by the time we'll get to the strongest point, it will be irrelevant anymore. Now, remember the story, there are users too, in particular, and this is dramatic, right? Investor is not going to invest if they don't think that they're going to use the product, or they don't think of someone that they know that is going to use the product. Now, if this is the case, we need to tell them a user story. And we need to create this emotional engagement between them and using the product or between someone that they know and using the product. And uh, um, if we are creating this emotional engagement, then we dramatically increase the likelihood that they will invest. If we are not, then they're not going to invest. Now, how do we do that? Through telling a story. If we don't know how to tell a good story, then we should learn. Then bring a couple of uh, um, experts in telling stories here and teach them. OK, good. Um, now, if this is venture capitals, they are not investing if this is not large enough market. It simply doesn't fit their market, right? If their, their model. Uh, so if this is not going to be uh, billions of dollars of company, or they don't believe that this is the case, they are not going to invest. It might be very good business. It might be other investors would care. But for them, in their model, they need something that is going to grow fast and grow um, to a significant order of magnitude so they can actually pay for the rest of the failures of the, of the, of the rest of the startups that, uh, that they invested at. And you ended up with the strongest point at the end. Now, I can give you examples. What does it mean to start with the strongest point? There is always this welcome slide, right? Or introduction to whatever, right? Or, or, and uh, put the statement there. This slide is going to be there for minutes before you even start speaking. Put it there. And the same at the end. Um, so disruption. And this is, uh, this is dramatic, because in a lot of cases, we're thinking of disruptive technology. 
disruption is not about technology. It's about changing the way we are doing business. It's about changing the way we behave. And this could be through a um, new product that does not exist in the market. This could be a new pricing model, right? So Waze was free. Very different than anything, than anyone else at the time. Today, everyone free because you cannot, you cannot charge money on something that, that there is something that is good enough and free. Um, maybe you change the business model. So something that people used to buy, you simply um, um, rent that out and you change the business model and as a result you disrupt the entire market. Or maybe you create a new set of information that was not available in the market beforehand and as a result you change the market equilibrium. So just imagine um, online travel agency, right, OTAs, whether or not this is Kayak or Travelocity or, or Expedia or whatever. Before you would go into your travel agent and say, I want to fly to New York, and they will give you a printed ticket, right? That was actually printed in several copies with red copy, uh, if you remember that, right? And <coughs> you didn't even know what are the alternatives, right? Now, as soon as you introduce all the knowledge into the system, you change the demand. And you um, basically uh, change the market equilibrium. Now, the good news is that in most cases, market the new market equilibrium is going to be much bigger business than, than before. In the disruptors, they are always newcomers. They are the ones that have nothing to lose. Because existing business are not going to disrupt their own market. They have too much to lose. They have too much to lose, actually, in two levels. One is that they're going to, let's say that we are selling whatever, right, today, and the market, the disruption is that we're going to give that away for free. Tomorrow morning, I have less revenues than today. I don't even know how to deal with that. Um, we have seen something in Israel fairly recently that there were entrants of new mobile operators, and they came out with a 20-pound flat fee um, for everything, right? And so obviously they dragged the entire market um, and, and uh, every, every other mobile operator lose a lot of market share throughout. Now, if each one of the mobile operators that was existing in Israel beforehand could have done that before. No one would. So part is that we're afraid to lose revenues that we already have. The other part that is even more significant is that disruption usually means that, uh, um, that we are saying um, we have a new way of doing business. The old way is not valid anymore. Now, this is very scary change for organizations, and in particular for the experts within the organizations, that all of a sudden um, everything that they are doing is not valid anymore. So just giving you a perspective, um, Waze is a um, map-making company, right? There is no one that understands GIS at Waze. We simply built what we, we thought we should be, be building. And this is not according to the theory of GIS and not according to anything else. Um, and, uh, um, and this is pretty consistent. Right? So uh, if you want to disrupt, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have uh, pre-knowledge. Some markets that are calling for disruption, and this is a uh, you know, if you go, go out of here and decide to solve one of those, then this is going to be uh, amazing. Um, um, any place that there is lack of transparency, right? So information is missing or asymmetric. It's fairly easy to figure out the information and redistribute the information so it will change the demand. A market with a middleman. A middleman is a cover-up for lack of transparency. So, um, so think about it, right? The r only reason the why we need a middleman is that information is not flowing, either it's not available or it's not flowing um, free enough, freely enough uh, to make the decisions. Um, a market where um, price is dramatically different than the value. If you want an example, medical services in the US are five times more expensive than they are in the UK. Five times more expensive. Now, it's not that they're five times better. They're actually about equal. 
Um, so obviously there is inefficiency of 5x in the system and you can figure that out in multiple places where, where it appears. Uh, places where regulation does not work. So I'll give you an example. If your flight is delayed by more than three hours according to the European regulations, two hours in different places, then you're actually entitled to get uh, um, 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 monetary compensation for the delay. Only two and a half percent actually claiming that. Two and a half percent of the people. So imagine 200 people in a plane, and this plane is delayed by five hours or whatever. Five people would be actually asking for that. So the regulation is in place, but no one is doing anything about it. Now, if you'll try, you'll see that it's actually fairly hard, right? So, so you'll get to, uh, you'll figure out, okay, I'm going to send them an email, right? No, there is no email. There is a form that need to fill up, and this is a long form, right? Very long form. <laughs> and when you get to the down of it and you say submit, the link is broken. <laughs> And you don't know that because you think, okay, maybe something went wrong. And so you go into this form again. It's a long form, very long form, right? And you hit submit again, and it's still broken. And so they will try to make it hard for people to claim, and they are successful in that. Um, VAT refund, right? If I would buy something here today and I'm traveling back to Israel, I can claim the VAT back. Actually, there is 30 billion euros of VAT in Europe every year that needs to be claimed, and it's not. Only 5% is being claimed. Um, so I'm giving you a little bit of indications of what my next startup is all about. <laughs> um, now, in general, disruption is good. And the goodness of disruption is that if you think about it from a very abstractive point of view, here is the market equilibrium. Here is the new market equilibrium. If it wouldn't be better, the market wouldn't go there. And so in general, the new market equilibrium in most cases is actually at higher volume, lower prices. So take Uber, for example, right? And uh, um, you look at the US market, the number of uh, on-demand trips increased five-folds since Uber started. And prices are much, uh, much lower today. And so obviously there was a much bigger demand at a lower price. Um, and, uh, um, and as soon as you make that available, then it becomes significant. Now the car industry is maybe the most in the interesting industry in the, in the next decade or so, in particular because uh, in the last 100 years, nothing has changed, right? So uh, the most sellable car in America 100 years ago was Ford, and it was black and it was doing about 16 miles per gallon. And last year it was Ford, and it was still black, and it was doing about 17 miles per, per gallon. <laughs> it was Ford F-150 last year and Ford T 100 years ago. But really nothing has changed, right? So we're still sitting in the driver's seat, we still have a steering wheel, we still have pedals, and, uh, and we still drive the car. Now the autonomous vehicles are going to change everything. So just imagine for a second that, um, that there, the technology is there and the technology is going to be there and, and I don't care if this is going to be next week or next year or five years down the road. Eventually we will have the technology is ready. And by the way, the autonomous vehicle driver is much better drivers than all of us, even though that we don't want to admit that. And, uh, um, it's still the case. And they don't get tired, and they don't uh, get distracted by looking into text messages or whatever. Um, they actually are uh, very, very good drivers. Um, and so if this is the case, and imagine that I would have, instead of a guy, I would have a click here, and I click on the click, and the car shows up and takes me wherever I want to go. And then I click again, and the car disappears. And uh, um, if this is the case, then maybe I don't need to own a car. Maybe I just need a clicker. And I can use the car anytime that I need. And I can use different, I, I would have different clicks on the clicker that I can have different cars anytime that I want. If this is the case, the demand is going to be changed, right? So instead of buying cars, we will be buying a service. Maybe mileage, maybe time, maybe whatever, trips something else. 
Now, if you think of the car today, it is probably the most inefficient resource in the Western world that we have because we use that only 4% of the day. Now, actually, not even that, right? Because when we use that, it's only us in the car, right? So we are using one seat of the car, the driver's seat, for 4% of the day. The rest of the time, not only that we are not using that, it's actually occupying a parking place. So it's actually creating more damage than help. So if this is go what's going to happen, then the business model is going to change. Now, this is a major problem for you if you are a car maker, because you will be selling much less cars 10 years down the road, much less. They will be, and if you don't adapt fast enough to start selling service, you will die. Your organization is built to manufacture a million cars a year. If you would be selling 200,000, this is way too few for you to survive. Wait, I'll, I'll, I'll get to a different, different perspective on that. So, uh, so one thing about, uh, um, so, so the business model will be changed, but as a result, there will be a derivative disruptions in the market, right? So if you are driving school, then you have a problem. In fact, um, so, so I see here some people that actually probably do have kids, but uh, um, so I have five kids, right? And the youngest one is 15 and he is not driving. The rest of them are driving. Um, but I assume that uh, um, all of them will be driving. My grandkids will not drive. In fact, I will need to tell them a story that I used to drive a car and they will not believe me. <laughs> because when I was young, and one day I asked my dad to take me to school, to drive me to school, and he said, this is less than half a mile away, walk, right? Or take your bike or do whatever. And then I really asked him, and he said, you know, when I was at your age, I was actually riding a donkey to school. And I did not believe him. <laughs> um, and so um, this is the reality, right? Um, if you want, take a dial phone, right? Remember that we used to have a phone with a dial? And give it to your kids and see if they can figure out what to do with it. Um, so driving schools will disappear, parking garages will disappear. Um, what if your business is about selling um, car insurance? If you don't figure out what's the new business model for you, you will disappear, you will die. So um, what we are seeing here is, is a major traffic jam, right? Actually 200 vehicles, no, 177 vehicles carrying 200 people. This is what we're seeing. Okay. These are the people. The problem is that as long as we are a single person within a vehicle, then we occupy so much street space um, that it doesn't make sense, <coughs> that we don't have enough street space for all these vehicles. Now, in fact, autonomous vehicles are going to increase that, right? Because, um, by the way, if we will fit into three buses, then this is it, right? Um, so remember this one, and here is a question for you. How it's going to look like with uh, Uber? The number of vehicles is going to increase, right? Because some of the Uber drivers are sitting there and driving to their destination in order to pick up someone. With autonomous vehicles, it's going to be even more significant. So Uber driver, because... Uh, because um, it's easier for them to park when they are not driving someone or they don't have a call, they would be parking someplace. Autonomous vehicle is not going to park. It's cheaper to keep on driving. So for those 200 people or for those we might have ended up with 400 vehicles or 500 vehicles. So traffic jams are not going to be better unless we start to use public transportation or we are starting to use uh, ride sharing or, or carpool um, or bicycle, right? So I, uh, I saw that you're riding your bike uh, and that's, this is awesome. Um, actually, I hate traffic jams so bad that I'm usually riding my bike or using public transportation. Um, 
Yeah, I'm going to skip that. Um, another area that is pretty significant is, uh, is if you don't know how much you're paying. If you don't know how much you're paying, then you're paying too much. And it doesn't matter if this is about financial fees or the mechanic or airfare um, or um, medical devices or legal or insurance. And the reason that there is a separation, uh, some of them are started that I already started and some of them are not, not yet. And so a few words about myself and then we'll have uh, maybe more questions and discussions. Um, so, uh, hmm. so there is a... a a thinner version of me at the picture there. Um, and, and I build startups. I, um, I'm looking for problems that are worth solving. And, uh, um, uh, and then I decide that I'm going to build a startup around them uh, if I figure out that the problem is big enough. And I will be looking for teams to build them. And I will um, invest and guide them and build them. And so here are my startups, so ways we are all uh, familiar with. Uh, Move it. Anyone here uses Move it? So it's like ways, but for public transportation. And actually, even more interesting uh, because public transportation solve traffic jams and, uh, uh, and driving doesn't. Um, and, uh, um, and because it's growing faster than ways at the time. And answering the same question, how do I get from here to wherever I want to go right now, but using public transportation? The same way, crowdsource. So as soon as you have users, uh, so initially you start with uh, you know the basic uh, schedule, which obviously doesn't mean anything in in not even in London, right? So, um, but uh, uh, but it's uh, fairly accurate in London. Um, and then you use if there are GPSs within the system. And by the way, in most of the operators in Buenos Aires, there is uh, a GPS in the, all the buses. Uh, the information is not publicly available, uh, but, uh, um, but uh, Movit actually do have that. Um, uh, and then you use CrowdSource as the, the last uh, um, version of providing you all the information that you need. And uh, um, uh, so this is Movit. Uh, FIEX deals with uh, the biggest secret in the world, financial fees. There are $600 billion of financial fees in the US every year, 600 billion, right? Um, and the scary part is that most people don't even know that they are paying them. So I noticed on the list that there are a few um, uh, Americans here. American, for a second, raise your hand. Okay. Do you have 401k plan? Do you know how much fees you are paying there? Okay. If I would have this dialogue with 100 Americans, if I would find one person that knows, that's going to be my lucky day. People don't know. Now, we think it's not a lot, right? So it's fees, it's not a big deal, right? So maybe only 1% a year. This is your lifetime saving. 1% a year compound effect of that, it's going to end up as one third of your lifetime saving. One third of your lifetime saving is going to go down the drain on fees because you don't even know that you're paying them. And I started that, this is the startup, by the way, that I decided in 2009 that I'm going to build. Uh, and the reason was fairly simple. Um, 2008 was a terrible year on the market, and I got my annual statement beginning of 2009. And in addition to losing 20% on the market, they charged me 1.5% essentially for losing fees, right? By itself, is not a big deal. The fact that I didn't know is the one that frustrated me. And then I started to ask my friends how much fees they're paying. And none of them knew. And so I realized if no one knows, this is a secret. Um, and it was well-kept secret. And uh, uh, FIEX essentially established transparency. So only in the US market allows people to understand how much fees they're paying and how to reduce them. And this is fairly dramatic. Um, rumor is, uh, is a marketplace for non-refundable hotel reservation. So just imagine a situation that you're making travel plans and you're making hotel reservation and then ch ch plans change and you get stuck with reservations that you cannot use. Then simply sell the reservation to someone else. 
And in fact, hotels are actually going to encourage you to do that because they're making 30% more of their revenues from incidentals, right? Food and beverages and internet and whatever. Um, Zeek is another marketplace, a marketplace for store credit. Actually very successful here in the UK. Um, and uh, um, you know, imagine that you return something to the store and you get the store credit that you can use within the chain. Uh, turns out that 30% of those are never being used. Right, so, so now I can see people nodding their head and that means that I just remind them of one that, that they should be using, right? So if this is on the wallet, the wallet will be the graveyard of all store credits, right? Um, these 30% is 100 billion euros a year, only in Europe, 100 billion euros of unused money that goes down the drain. And so Zeke is simply a marketplace for that. Um, Angie deals with the frustrations of going to the mechanic. Um, if I will take my car to the mechanic, whatever they'll say, I'll say, okay, I have no clue, right? If they will tell me that I need to replace the carburetor, then I will say, okay, go ahead and replace the carburetor. Now, the only problem is that there is no carburetor in my car. Uh, they don't make car with carburetors for two decades now. And, uh, um, but I have no clue, right? And so it's an app running on the smartphones connects to the car computer, doing the diagnostics for you, and then asking mechanics to quote to repair that. So all of a sudden empower the driver not only with the knowledge, but also with the ability to do price comparison. Now the price comparison is pretty scary because the differences are fairly, fairly huge. Right? So, uh, so you'll get a quote that is, uh, um, is 100 pound to 300 pound for the same thing, the same thing. Now, up until today, we are unable to, uh, to compare prices, right? So, um, uh, because you go to the mechanic, you leave the car there, and they'll say, okay, we're going to call you in the afternoon and tell you how much it is, right? Fairfly deals with uh, um, the biggest secret uh, um, in the travel industry, and this is uh, what happened to airfare after we book our flight. Now, before, we all comparing prices, but after that, no one does. In reality, beforehand, so, so, so airfare in general, um, in any market that had um, expiration period for that, so hotels, events, airlines, um, train tickets, and so forth, will build dynamic pricing that their pricing is actually based on the demand. Now, we as users, we don't know that. And so what Fairfly does, monitor your own itinerary after you book your flight. And if the price drops below cancellation fees, then it basically tells you that right now you're leaving money on the table and you can actually rebook the same flight at a cheaper price. And it's quite a lot. I can see that. Um, spam off is dealing with SMS spam. It's actually the first one that I try to deal with uh, regulation that doesn't work. And I'm actually um, very proud of this startup because it's my son who is uh, 23 years old that started that um, and i'm proud not because whether or not they're going to be successful or not because he decided to do something that is doing good and doing well um, and so at least something of the education that i try to put into the system uh, turns out to be successful so um, and there are more that i will be building um, in the, um, this year probably we'll try to deal with parking probably we'll deal with the vat refunds for tourists in europe um, maybe more um, now let's keep that so maybe one more story um, yeah, and then we'll have some more time for questions um, so over the years of ways i had um, a lot of people coming to me and say, thank you for ways that you helped me to avoid speeding tickets or traffic jams or, or let me tell you a story about a nightmare traffic jam and so forth. But about a year ago, someone came to me and said, uh, thank you. And I said, you're welcome. I said, you saved my marriage. And I said, what? He said, well, because of ways, we don't need to argue anymore in the car, so you saved my marriage. <laughs> Uh, and so I turned out to be a marriage consultant as well. <laughs> uh, but I think I own the best story to my son. Uh, I have, uh, so the 23 years old we mentioned, I also have 19 years old son. 
and he started to drive about uh, two years ago and he really likes to drive he would you know to go to his his neighbor he would drive there right um, and so one day I asked him to um, drive me to the airport and he said um, my phone is broken I can't <laughs> and I said what do you mean you can not here's the car here are the keys drive me to the airport he said my phone is broken I don't know how to get there so I was scratching my head for a second and I said, you know what, I'm going to be in the car with you and I'll tell you how to get there. And then he said, and how would I come back? <laughs> <laughs> and so we lose orientation in the same way that we don't remember phone numbers anymore. Um, and, uh, uh, but we don't lose the logic. Thank you. Questions? <laughs>